the next morning, instead of sleeping late the way she usually did. Mom got up with us kids and walked over to the Battle Mountain. Intermediate school, which was across the street from the Mary S. Black Elementary School, she applied for a job and was hired right away, since SHE had a degree, and there were never enough teachers in Battle Mountain. The few teachers the town did have were not exactly the pick of the litter, as Dad liked to say, and despite the shortage, one would get fired from time to time. A couple of weeks earlier, Miss Page had gotten the axe when the principal caught her toting a loaded rifle down the school hall. Miss Page said all she wanted to do was motivate her students to do their homework. Lori's teacher had stopped showing up around the same time Miss Page was fired, so Mom was assigned to teach Lori's class. Her students really liked her. She had the same philosophy about educating children that she had about rearing them. She thought rules and discipline held people back and felt that the best way to let children fulfill their potential was by providing freedom. She didn't care if her students were late or didn't do their homework. If they wanted to act out, that was fine with her, as long as they didn't hurt anyone else. Mom was all the time hugging her students and letting them know how wonderful and special she thought they were. She'd tell the Mexican kids never to let anyone say they weren't as good as white kids. She'd tell the Navajo and Apache kids they should be proud of their noble Indian heritage. Students who were considered problem kids or mentally slow started doing well. Some followed mom around like stray dogs. Even though her students liked her, mom hated teaching. She had to leave Maureen, who was not yet two, with a woman whose drug dealer husband was serving time in the state prison. But what really bothered mom was that her mother had been a teacher and had pushed mom into getting a teaching degree so she would have a job to fall back on just in case her dreams of becoming an artist didn't pan out. Mom felt Grandma Smith had lacked faith in her artistic talent and by becoming a teacher. Now, she was acknowledging that her mother had been right all along. At night she sulked and muttered under her breath. In the morning she slept, late and pretended to be sick. It was up to Lori, Brian, and me to get her out of bed and see to it that she was dressed and at school on time. I'm a grown woman now, Mom said almost every morning. Why can't? I do what I want to do. Teaching is rewarding and fun. Lori said, quote, you'll grow to like it. Part of the problem was that the other teachers and the principal, Miss Beatty, thought mom was a terrible teacher. They'd stick their heads into her classroom and see the students playing tag and throwing erasers. While mom was up front, spinning like a top and letting pieces of chalk fly from her hands to demonstrate centrifugal force. Miss Beatty, who wore her glasses on a chain around her neck and had her hair done at the beauty parlor over in Winnemucca every week, told Mom she needed to discipline her students. Miss Beatty also told Mom to submit weekly lesson plans, keep her classroom tidy, and grade the homework promptly. But mom was always getting confused and filling in the wrong dates on the lesson plans or losing the homework. Miss Beatty threatened to fire mom, so Lori, Brian, and I started helping mom with her schoolwork. I'd go to her classroom after school and clean her chalkboard, dust her erasers, and pick the paper up off the floor. At night Lori, Brian, and I went over her students' homework and tests. Mom let us 
Grade papers that had multiple choice, true false, and fill in. The blank answers. Just about anything except essay questions, which she thought she had to evaluate because they could be answered correctly. In all sorts of different ways. I liked grading homework. I liked knowing that I could do what grown ups did for a living. Lori also helped mom with her lesson plans. She'd make sure mom filled them in accurately. And she'd correct mom's spelling and math. Mom, double L's in Halloween. Lori said, erasing mom's writing and penciling in the changes. Double S as well, and no silent E at the end. Mom marveled at how brilliant Lori was. Lori gets straight as she once told me. So do I. I said, yes, but you have to work for them. Mom was right. Lori was brilliant. I think helping mom like that was one of Lori's favorite things in the world. She wasn't very athletic and didn't like exploring as much as Brian and I did, but she loved anything having to do with pencil and paper. After mom and Lori finished the lesson plans, they'd sit around the school table, sketching each other and cutting out magazine photos of animals and landscapes and people with wrinkled faces and putting them in mom's folder of potential painting. Subjects. Lori understood mom better than anyone. It didn't bother her that when Miss Beatty showed up to observe mom's class, mom started yelling at Lori to prove to Miss Beatty that she was capable of disciplining her. Students. One time mom went so far as to order Lori up to the front of the class, where she gave her a whipping with a wooden paddle. Were you acting up? I asked Lori when I heard about the whipping. No, Lori said. Then why would mom paddle you? She had to punish someone, and she didn't want to upset the other kids. Quote, Lori said, once mom started teaching, I thought maybe we'd be able to buy new clothes, eat cafeteria lunches, and even spring for nifty extras. Like the class pictures the school took every year. Mom and Dad had never been able to buy the class pictures for us, though a couple of times. Mom secretly snipped a snapshot out of the packet before returning it. Despite Mom's salary, we didn't buy the class pictures that year, or even steal them, but that was probably just as well. Mom had read somewhere that mayonnaise was good for your hair, and the morning the photographer was coming to school, she slathered a few spoonfuls on mine. She didn't realize you were supposed to wash out the mayonnaise. And in the picture that year I was peering out from under one stiff shingle of hair. Still, things did improve. Even though Dad had been fired from the Bearite mine, we were able to continue living in the depot by paying rent to the mining company, since not a lot of other families were vying for the place. We now had food in the fridge, at least until it got toward the end of the month, when we usually ran out of money because neither mom nor dad ever mastered the art of budgeting. But mom's salary created a whole new set of problems. While dad liked it that mom was bringing home a paycheck, he saw himself as the head of the household, and he maintained that the money should be turned over to him. It was his responsibility, he'd say to handle the family finances, and he needed money to fund his gold leaching research. The only research you're doing is on the liver's capacity to absorb alcohol, mom said. Still, she found it hard to straight out defy dad. For some reason, she didn't have it in her to say no to him. If she tried, he'd argue and wheedle and sulk and bully and plain wear her down. So she 
resorted to evasive tactics. She'd tell Dad she hadn't cashed her paycheck, yet, or she'd pretend she'd left it at school, and hide it until she could sneak off to the bank. Then she'd pretend she'd lost all the money. Pretty soon Dad took to showing up at school on payday, waiting outside in the car, and taking us all straight to Winnemucca, where the bank was located, so Mom could cash her paycheck immediately. Dad insisted on escorting Mom into the bank. Mom had us kids come along so she could try to slip some of the cash to us first. Back in the car, Dad would go through Mom's purse and take the money out. On one trip, Mom went into the bank alone because Dad couldn't find a place to park. When she came out, she was missing a sock. Jeanette, I'm going to give you a sock that I want you to put in a safe place. Mom said once she got in the car. She winked hard at me as she reached inside her bra and pulled out her other sock, knotted in the middle and bulging at the toe. Hide it where no one can get it, because you know how scarce socks can get in our house. God damn it, Rosemary. Dad snapped. Do you think I'm a fucking idiot? What? Mom asked, throwing her arms up in the air. Am I not allowed to give my daughter a sock? She winked at me again, just in case I didn't get it. Back in Battle Mountain, Dad insisted we go to the Owl Club to celebrate payday, and ordered steaks for all of us. They tasted so good, we forgot we were eating a week's worth of groceries. Hey, Mountain, Goat, Dad said at the end of the dinner, while Mom was putting our table scraps in her purse. Why don't you let me borrow that sock for a second? I looked around the table. No one met my eye except Dad, who was grinning like an alligator. I handed over the sock. Mom gave a dramatic sigh of defeat and let her head drop down on the table. To show who was in charge, Dad left the waitress a $10 tip but on the way out, Mom slipped it into her purse. Soon we were out of money again. When Dad dropped Brian and me off at school, he noticed that we weren't carrying lunch bags. Where are your lunches? Dad asked us. We looked at each other and shrugged. There's no food in the house. Brian said. When Dad heard that, he acted outraged as though he'd learned for the first time that his children were going hungry. Damn it, that Rose Mary keeps spending money on art supplies. He muttered, pretending to be talking to himself. Then he declared more loudly, no child of mine has to go hungry. After he dropped us off, he called after us. Don't you kids worry about a thing. At lunch Brian and I sat together in the cafeteria. I was pretending to help him with his homework so that no one would ask us why we weren't eating when dad appeared in the doorway, carrying a big grocery bag. I saw him scanning the room, looking for us. My young uns forgot to take their lunch to school today. He announced to the teacher on cafeteria duty as he walked toward us. He set the bag on the table in front of Brian and me and took out a loaf of bread, a whole package of bologna, a jar of mayonnaise, a half-gallon jug of orange juice, two apples, a jar of pickles, and two candy bars. Have I ever let you down? He asked Brian and me and then turned and walked away. In a voice so low that Dad didn't hear him, Brian said. Yes. Dad has to start carrying his weight. Lori said as she stared into the empty refrigerator. He does. I said. He brings in money from odd jobs. He spends more than he earns on booze. 
Brian said. He was whittling. The shavings falling to the floor right outside the kitchen where we were. Standing. Brian had taken to carrying a pocket knife with him at all times. And he often whittled pieces of scrap wood when he was working. Something out in his head. It's not all for booze. I said. Most of it's for research on cyanide. Leaching. Dad doesn't need to do research on leaching. Brian said. He's an expert. He and Lori cracked up. I glared at them. I knew more about Dad's situation than they did because he talked to me more than anyone. Else in the family, we'd still go demon hunting in the desert together. For old time's sake, since by then I was seven and two grown up too. Believe in demons. Dad told me about all his plans and showed me his pages of graphs and calculations and geological charts depicting the layers of sediment where the gold was buried. He told me I was his favorite child, but he made me promise not to tell. Lori or Brian or Maureen. It was our secret. I swear, honey, there are. Times when I think you're the only one around who still has faith in me. Quote, he said, I don't know what I'd do if you ever lost it. I told him that I would never lose faith in him. And I promised myself I never would. A few months after mom had started working as a teacher, Brian and I passed by the green lantern. The clouds above the setting sun were streaked scarlet and purple. The temperature was dropping quickly, from searing hot to chilly within a matter of minutes, like it always did in the desert at dusk. A woman with a fringed shawl draped over her shoulders was smoking a cigarette on the Green Lantern's front porch. She waved at Brian, but he didn't wave back. You who, Brian, it's me, sugar. Ginger, she called. Brian ignored her. Who's that? I asked. Some friend of dad's. He said. She's dumb. Why is she dumb? She doesn't even know all the words in a sad sack comic book. Brian, said. He told me that dad had taken him out for his birthday a while back. In the drugstore. Dad had let Brian pick out whatever present he wanted, so. Brian chose a sad sack comic book. Then they went to the Nevada Hotel, which was near the Owl Club and had a sign outside saying Bar Grill. Clean modern. They had dinner with Ginger, who kept laughing and talking real loud and touching both Dad and Brian. Then all three climbed the stairs to one of the hotel rooms. It was a suite, with a small front room and a bedroom. Dad and Ginger went into the bedroom while Brian stayed in the front room and read his new comic book. Later, when Dad and Ginger came out, she sat down next to Brian. He didn't look up. He kept staring at the comic book even though he'd already read it all. The way through twice, Ginger declared that she loved Sad Sack. So Dad made Brian give Ginger the comic book, telling him it was the gentlemanly thing to do. It was mine, Brian said, and she kept asking me to read the bigger words. She's a grown-up, and she can't even read a comic book. Brian had taken such a powerful dislike to Ginger that I realized she must have done something more than Shanghai his comic book. I wondered if he had figured out something about Ginger and the other ladies at the Green Lantern. Maybe he knew why Mom said they were bad. Maybe that was why he was mad. Did you learn what they do inside the Green Lantern? I asked. Brian stared off ahead. I tried to see what he was looking at, but there was nothing there except for the Tuscarora Mountains rising up to meet the darkening sky. 
Then he shook his head. She makes a lot of money. Quote, he said. And she should buy her own darn comic book. Some people like to make fun of Battle Mountain. A big newspaper out east once held a contest to find the ugliest, most forlorn, most godforsaken town in the whole country, and it declared battle. Mountain the winner. The people who lived there didn't hold it in much regard, either. They'd point to the big yellow and red sign way up on a pole at the shell station, the one with the burned out S, and say with a sort of perverse pride, yep, that's where we live, hell. But I was happy in Battle Mountain. We'd been there for nearly a year, and I considered it home, the first real home I could remember. Dad was on the verge of perfecting his cyanide gold process, Brian and I had. The desert, Lori and Mom painted and read together, and Maureen, who had silky white blonde hair and a whole gang of imaginary friends, was happy running around with no diaper on. I thought our days of packing up and driving off in the middle of the night were over. Just after my eighth birthday, Billy Deal and his dad moved into the tracks. Billy was three years older than me, tall and skinny with a sandy crew cut in blue eyes. But he wasn't handsome. The thing about Billy was that he had a lopsided head. Bertha Whitefoot, a half-Indian woman who lived in a shack near the depot and kept about fifty dogs fenced in her yard, said it was because Billy's mom hadn't turned him over at all when he was a baby. He just lay there in the same position day in and day out, and the side of his head that was pressed against the mattress got a little flat. You didn't notice it all that much unless you looked at him straight on. And not a lot of people did, because Billy was always moving around like he was itchy. He kept his Marlboros rolled up in one of his t-shirt sleeves, and he lit his cigarettes with a Zippo lighter stamp with a picture of a naked lady bending over. Billy lived with his dad in a house made of tar paper and corrugated tin. Down the tracks from our house, he never mentioned his mom and maid. It clear that you weren't supposed to bring her up, so I never knew if she had run off or died. His dad worked in the Bearite mine and spent his evenings at the Owl Club, so Billy had a lot of unsupervised time on his hands. Bertha Whitefoot took to calling Billy the devil with a crew cut, and the terror of the tracks. She claimed he set fire to a couple of her dogs, and skinned some neighborhood cats and strung their naked pink bodies up on a clothesline to make jerky. Billy said Bertha was a big fat liar. I didn't know whom to believe. After all, Billy was a certified JD. Juvenile delinquent. He had told us that he spent time in a detention center in Reno for shoplifting and vandalizing cars. Shortly after he moved to the tracks, Billy started following me around. He was always looking at me and telling the other kids he was my boyfriend. No, he's not, I would yell, though I secretly liked it that he wanted to. B. A few months after he'd moved to town, Billy told me he wanted to show me something really funny. If it's a skinned cat, I don't want to see it. I said, nah, it ain't nothing like that. He said, it's really funny, you'll laugh, and laugh, I promise, unless you're scared, course I'm not scared, I said, the funny thing Billy wanted to show me was in his house, which was, dark inside and smelled like pee, and was even messier than our house, although in a different way, our house was filled with stuff, papers, books, tools, lumber, 
paintings, art supplies, and statues of Venus de Milo painted all different colors. There was hardly anything in Billy's house. No furniture. Not even wooden spool tables. It had only one room. With two mattresses on the floor next to a TV. There was nothing on the walls. Not a single painting or drawing. A naked light bulb hung from the ceiling, right next to three or four dangling spiral strips of flypaper so thick with flies that you couldn't see the sticky yellow surface. Underneath, empty beer cans and whiskey bottles and a few half-eaten tins of Vienna sausages littered the floor. On one of the mattresses, Billy's father was snoring unevenly. His mouth hung open and flies were gathered in the stubble of his beard. A wet stain had darkened his pants, nearly to his knees. His zipper was undone, and his gross penis dangled to one side. I stared quietly, then asked, What's the funny thing? Don't you see? said Billy, pointing at his dad. He pissed himself. Billy started laughing. I felt my face turning hot. You're not supposed to laugh at your own. Father, I said to him, ever. Ah, now, don't go get all high and mighty on me. Billy said, don't go, and try and pretend you're better than me. Cause I know your daddy ain't. Nothing but a drunk like mine. I hated Billy at that moment, I really did. I thought of telling him about binary numbers and the glass castle and venus and all the things that made my dad special and completely different from his dad but i knew billy wouldn't understand i started to run out of the house but then i stopped and turned around my daddy is nothing like your daddy i shouted when my daddy passes out he never pisses himself at dinner that night I started telling everyone about Billy Deal's disgusting dad and the ugly dump they lived in. Mom put down her fork. Jeanette, I'm disappointed in you. She said, you should show more compassion. Why? I said, he's bad. He's a JD. No child is born a delinquent. Mom said, they only became that way. She went on if nobody loved them when they were kids. Unloved, children grow up to become serial murderers or alcoholics. Mom looked, pointedly at Dad and then back at me. She told me I should try to be nicer to Billy. He doesn't have all the advantages you kids do. She said, the next time I saw Billy, I told him I'd be his friend, but not his girlfriend if he promised not to make fun of anyone's dad. Billy promised, but he kept trying to be my boyfriend. He told me that if I'd be his girlfriend, he would always protect me and make sure nothing bad ever happened to me and buy me expensive presents. If I wouldn't be his girlfriend, he said, I'd be sorry. I told him if he didn't want to be just friends, fine with me, I wasn't scared of him. After about a week, I was hanging out with some other kids from the tracks, watching garbage burn in a big rusty trash can. They were all throwing in pieces of brush to keep the fire going, plus chunks of tire treads, and we cheered at the thick black rubber smoke that made our Noses sting as it rolled past us into the air. Billy came up to me and pulled my arm, motioning me away from the other kids. He dug into his pocket and pulled out a turquoise and silver ring. It's for you, he said. I took it and turned it over in my hand. Mom had a collection of turquoise and silver Indian jewelry that she kept at Grandma's house so dad wouldn't pawn it most of it was antique and very valuable some man from a museum in phoenix kept trying to buy pieces from her 
and when we visited grandma mom would let me and lori put on the heavy necklaces and bracelets and concha belts billy's ring looked like one of mom's i ran it across my teeth and tongue like mom had taught me to i could tell by the slightly bitter taste that it was real silver where'd you get this i asked it used to be my mom's billy said it sure was a pretty ring it had a simple thin band and an oval shaped piece of dark turquoise held in place by snaking silver strands i didn't have any jewelry and it had been a long time since anyone had given me a present except for the planet venus i tried on the ring it was way too big for my finger but i could wrap yarn around the band the way high school girls did when they wore their boyfriend's rings i was afraid however that if i took the ring billy might start thinking that i had agreed to be his girlfriend he'd tell all the other kids and if I said it wasn't true, he'd point to the ring. On the other hand, I figured mom would approve, since accepting it would make Billy feel good about himself. I decided to compromise. I'll keep it, I said, but I'm not going to wear it. Billy's smile spread all across his face. But don't think this means we're boyfriend and girlfriend, I said. And, don't think this means you can kiss me. I didn't tell anyone about the ring, not even Brian. I kept it in my pants, pocket during the day, and at night I hid it in the bottom of the cardboard box where I kept my clothes. But Billy Deal had to go and shoot his mouth off about giving me the ring. He started telling the other kids things like how, as soon as I was old enough me and him were going to get married when i found out what he was saying i knew accepting the ring had been a big mistake i also knew i should return it but i didn't i meant to and every morning i'd put it in my pocket with the intention of giving it back but i couldn't bring myself to do it that ring was too darn pretty